Welcome back. Our next guest could be called a force of nature. She has the most incredible and diverse background of just about anyone we've heard from today. And Lori Fitzpagato is also an author. So she's going to tell us a little bit about her history and what got her there. But then we really want to hear about her new book, Dancing in the Dash. Lori, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Lauren, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, it's an honor to have you. And can you give us a little bit of background? Your, your history you know, spans just government service, dance, travel, the world, everything people mostly dream about, but you've actually done it. So let's start from the beginning. Thank you so much. I am a native Washingtonian. Uh, my parents, one from the South, and one from the area, both met at Howard University. Uh, and um, I lived in New York for a little while, but DC is really my home and where I grew up. Uh, I began dancing when I was five, taking ballet. And I was so lucky to be in a fabulous dance school in Washington, DC that was started by two black women for children of color. Went to Vassar undergrad went into the Foreign Service right out of college, served as a diplomat in Mexico and the Dominican Republic, and came back and have had a fabulous career in public affairs, communications, PR, lobbying. I was in the Clinton administration, uh, have been involved in politics and policy, international trade. I worked for Ron Brown, who was the former chairman of the Democratic Party and the Secretary of Commerce under Bill Clinton. And um, I just retired three and a <laughs> half years ago um, after a 42 year career. And I like someone defined retirement as re-dash tiring. So <laughs> I have new tires on and I'm in my next chapter doing some fun things, but that's my background. Well, that makes perfect sense because retirement is, is not really at all a sit down and do nothing kind of job if you do it right. right. That's certainly what I've learned because you have a whole new series of ways to tire yourself also. So I know a lot of yours has to do with dance and your next chapter makes so much sense then that there would be a book tied to it. So let's talk about this chapter now. Thank you so much. Uh, I began writing, I used to keep journals uh, as, from childhood. And I decided once I was out of my nine to five, or I should say 24 seven <laughs> job uh, cycle, that I should focus a bit more on actually putting things together. And I started it really for legacy, family, grand grandchildren to do some research on ancestry. And of course, dance, which has always been a thread throughout my life. Uh, I performed for a while in Washington, D.C. with the Capitol Ballet, and then I moonlighted in the Dominican Republic. By day, I was a cultural affairs officer, and by night, I was dancing with the Dominican Ballet Company. So I couldn't give it up. And I've always been involved, I take classes all over the world, no matter where I travel. All my jobs have been major travel uh, globally. So it, I find that ballet, because of the technique, because of the terminology, if, if you know that and you have the ba basic technique and you understand the French terms, it is universal no matter where you are. So I've had classes in fabulous places with wonderful teachers. So I wanted to write about that and I wanted to talk about the importance of the arts. Um, the whole left side, right side uh, theory, and I guess it's true, it's science. The brain. That, <laughs> right, of the, yeah. uh, right, exactly, of the brain that it's wonderful to exercise both, so to speak, mm -hmm. to employ both and also to have a profession and a passion. Hopefully you can work in your area of passion, but some of us cannot. And to keep that fire going and to keep that enthusiasm. So what I've done after politics, uh, international trade, government, private sector, all of those things is I've returned to my passion in the arts. Uh, I think- 
Absolutely. And some of it, I think, comes from my dad, who was a Renaissance, who was a Renaissance man, and I guess still is. He's 89. But he was a government employee. He went to medical school first in Switzerland and Germany, probably my risk taking and being willing to travel all over the world and learn about new cultures. He didn't become a doctor, but he came back and he worked in laboratories. Uh, he was in the government, but what he did is his moonlighting was uh, he became a ranked amateur tennis player oh up until his seventies. Uh, he played tennis and he also was an actor. So he was in some TV shows and movies. He did voiceovers. He did live theater. So anything think, we would know? Um, well, he was in um, Homicide. Do you remember that? that I do. Film? Yes. He was in Homicide for several years. Um, he was in a couple of movies and I'm trying to remember with some of them pretty, okay. pretty long time ago. He was in the Howard Players and he actually went, performed with Toni Morrison, who was also at Howard University. So they toured all over and that was a historically black college and university, as you know. And, um, and he did Reading for the Blind. He's done Oth Othello. He's done Hamlet. He did mostly Shakespeare and Greek theater. And, um, and that's how I learned a lot. I learned my Shakespeare and Greek tragedy through cueing my dad for his lines. You can't buy it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I had to earn it, right? And um, so I've come from that kind of family. My mother was an English teacher and uh, she loved the arts. She loved ballet. And I think I kind of lived out some of what she would have wanted to do had she had the opportunity back in those times which was pretty tough for people of color and women to really enter the professions that I ended up being in. I'm very blessed. So were you, were you always an only, meaning did you find yourself as the only woman of color in the dance troops or was it, was it opening up for women of color at the time? Well, let's put it this way. I found myself as one of the only or very few in my professional life more than I did in my dance performance life because I went to, I was in an all black dance company. Uh, so my, so my daytime life was integrating schools, desegregating schools in Montgomery County uh, at Vassar. We were in the minority students of color and in my, in the foreign service, there were very few women uh, or uh, particularly women of color or people of color. So I found that I've been a trailblazer throughout my life um, in the world of lobbying and advocacy and representing foreign countries and being an in international trade. I was an assistant secretary of commerce uh, in the international trade area. I got very used to uh, being the only woman or very one of few and the only person of color. In my performance life, even in the Dominican Ballet Company, of course, Dominicans are of mixed heritage. Um, and uh, I didn't feel out of place because there were other brown people around me. Uh, and right now, I think it's a big struggle, frankly, in the world of dance, particularly in ballet, which is a European traditional um, art genre ballet. And it does not have enough people of color who are very talented and very well trained uh, in ballet companies, in ballet schools, in management, administration, teaching. So I think this is the moment when things are starting to change in our country and in the world in terms of inclusion yes. and diversity. So I've been working on some of those things as well. Of course you have, because it makes perfect sense. And I really do want to make sure we have time to talk about your book, because for the title caught me right away, Dancing in the Dash. And that dash, which I really learned about, I think it was from a movie many years ago, uh, where Four Weddings and a Funeral, where they used the poem, The Dash, which highlighted that dash on on a um on a headstone or at a funeral or the dash being the person's life and i believe that's the way you've used it and 
tied it into all of this experience and learning through dance, which I think a lot of people don't necessarily tie their passion and, as you say, their moonlighting job to the future and what they can do when they are maybe retired or into their next next. And so many of us are there now. So how did the book come to be and what are you doing with that? You are absolutely right that the concept of dash on a tombstone or indicating life and death of person with that dash in between and the poem, uh, and it's been used a great deal um, by many people. That was one interpretation of living in the moment, taking advantage of where you are. Um, and the other interpretation for me was running like running a hundred yard dash. And uh, I feel that in my life, uh, striving, uh, trying to do the best, uh, having other people have high expectations of me being an African-American woman, that it's a race, a race to a finish line that's very elusive. Mm -hmm. And when you think you finally achieved enough or you've performed well, or you've done your job or you've learned, you get to that finish line and then the finish line moves forward. Mm -hmm. And it's a constant dash because you have to rush through it and do it well and perhaps do it better. You know, as a woman, oftentimes we have to be twice as good in order to get that, that, uh, that basic credit. So, um, so I use that in, in two senses. Uh, and the book, I think, um, turned into, I, I wanted it to be a creative memoir. Uh, many memoirs, wonderful memoirs, but they're chronological. I was born here. I did this. And I think in the creative side of me, I wanted to figure out a way to make it creative. So the title I loved, Dancing in the Dash, and I thought it would make people curious about, well, is this about a dancer or what? I didn't want people to think that it was about dance. Um, and so the subtitle is my story of empowerment, diplomacy, and resilience. And I believe that the diplomatic part I've talked about, and I think diplomacy is critical in life. One can't always end up with the position that you have. Uh, you have to listen and sometimes compromise and also be very astute about how you raise issues and criticism and those types of things. So diplomacy has been a thread through my life. Um, dance has been a thread as I've discussed. And I think that everyone and children particularly should have an opportunity to study and to be engaged in some type of creative art. Uh, and I think dance particularly and ballet specifically uh, really imbues one with discipline with perseverance, with resilience, with tolerance for pain, with those point shoes on. <laughs> and I think it also helps you with performance, being able to stand in front of a group of people or a thousand people and keep your nerves or your wits about you and actually perform, speak, dance, act. So I think uh, all of these characteristics that I learned through ballet have been applicable in every career path I've been on. And I link them with each chapter having a reference to dance. The tap dance where I talked about the difficulty of lobbying and, and how lobbying has been branded as wearing a scarlet letter. And I explained it doesn't always have to be that way, but it is a dance. It's resonance, achieving resonance through the sound of the tap shoes, um, being in sync and hoping that your client can join in that type of synchronization. Um, I, I named uh, the first chapter is curtain first and then lights. Um, sometimes you can have lights and then curtain, but I wanted to say you've got to open that curtain and then you have the light on your life, etc. Uh, other chapters that are, um, are dance references as well. So dance is, is the light motif throughout the book. Uh, it was wonderful to write it. It was cathartic to have finished that, uh, that part of my life that 
career and running and 24 seven and answering clients at three o'clock in the morning because they're in another time zone. Um, it was so wonderful to sit back and reflect. And I think we all we all have a story. And yeah. I encourage everyone to write their story and to share their story because it's beneficial to other people as well. I absolutely agree. I could not agree more. Lori, where can people find the book? Oh, you can find it on Amazon and anywhere books are sold. Uh, last night, I had a book talk at Barnes & Noble Fifth Avenue, which was, wow, I never thought a little girl who started school at PS 140 in Jamaica, Queens, would end up on Fifth Avenue at Barnes & Noble talking about a book I'd written. And I had lots of friends come and it was wonderful. So uh, Barnes & Noble has it, of course. You can find it on Goodreads. Um, most, uh, most websites, uh, I'm sorry, most online bookstores and uh, politics and prose, all of those places that we know. So I'm delighted that it is very available. Perfect. And where can people learn more about you? Oh, uh, you learn about me right now. Everybody has to, <laughs> has to see this show. <laughs> and I know about the community that I know about the community that it's made for. And I will add that I am about to move into a 55 plus community um, <laughs> in a few months, actually, and on the eastern shore of Maryland. So um, I'll be joining the audience in that wonderful life um, of having all kinds of events and new friends and all of those things happen because life just starts in my view at 55. It just keep <laughs> starting. It's fabulous. Lori, thank you so much for visiting with us today. Lori Fitzpagato and the book is Dancing in the Dash. We'll post it here on the screen and also in the blog on the website. I hope you'll go out and learn more and take some of Lori's advice. Her, her stories are just compelling. Lori, Lori, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Lauren. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And we'll be right back. <laughs>